Would you stand with us, please? Welcome to Heritage Bible Church. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Raise your voices in praise to the Lord. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Help the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. house of the Lord together, isn't it? Let's just keep our singing up and our worship of him.
Good morning. Thank you, worship team. Welcome to Heritage Bible Church. I want to give a, a little update on some ministries that are happening this month and earlier. And to help me uh, with some updates, I want to invite uh, Dan Hopper and uh, Justin Hebert to come help me make some announcements. First of all, last Sunday we announced that there would be some baptism, baptisms today. And I want to let you know that those have been postponed. Mainly because uh, one person who was going to be baptized is a brand new believer, and they came up to me last Sunday, and they said, you know, I, I still want to be baptized, but I, I think I should go through the Alpha course first to really establish my faith and understand exactly what is involved with living out my faith. And I said, that's a great idea. And so we start Alpha the first Wednesday of uh, September. Alpha is a 10-week course. Really, uh, we gather for dinner. We watch a 30-minute video. We talk about it. It's great for establishing your faith. Uh, it's great for, for people wanting to explore faith. I talked with a woman last week at, at uh, Back to School Night for the school and invited her to come to Alpha. I know she's not a believer, but she wants to explore and, and ask questions. And we said, I said, then Alpha would be great for you. Um, and so... Uh, you know, and don't think it's just for people who, who are brand new Christians or exploring their faith. Uh, years ago, when, it, when we were here in town, we were at Alpha, and Rose Malama's mom, Rosie, went through Alpha. Alpha and Rosie, she was in her 70s. She had been in church all her life. And Rosie came up to me after going through Alpha and said, Jim, that was the best discipleship material I've ever gone through. You know? So I... Alpha is great for somebody who, who is new and exploring the faith and has a lot of questions. It's also great, it's a great combination of evangelism and discipleship, and so it really helps strengthen a, a believer as well. Dan Hopper, you're hiding behind that. Yeah, okay. Hey, tell us about the start of school this week. I'm trying to hide. It's just he's so big. <laughs> there you go. Now we can see eye to eye. Uh, school started this week on Wednesday. We have 300 kids on campus, preschool through eighth grade. Uh, it was uh, just a lot of activity, cars backed up, picking kids up. You can just imagine all the logistics 
all the schedules and classes and be here and be there and everywhere, um, all the people involved. But we have a great staff all the way through. Everybody pitches in, all hands on deck, all the time. And so we really appreciate that. It makes everything, it makes everything look really organized. You know, that's the most important thing is it looks organized. No, it is organized, um, but there's always, you know, we've got to put more water in this bucket because it's 107 degrees and the children are filling up their water containers like crazy. There's all, just always all kinds of things going on. Uh, one funny story from this week. On Wednesday, the first day of school, kindergarten class. Um, so uh, I, I checked with the ladies in the kitchen did, did all the teachers turn in their, um, their lunch lists? Every morning, the teachers turn in their list. Who's cold lunch? Who's hot lunch? So they know how to, you know, do last-minute planning. And kindergarten hadn't turned their list in yet. So I go to the kindergarten classroom, and they're trying to get it figured out. But when you ask a kindergartner a question, do you, are you cold lunch or hot lunch? They're like, uh, I don't know. You know, so the aide was unzipping all of their backpacks and looking for lunches and checking off the list. And, oh, and most of them had names, but some of them didn't have names. So they're, you know, they're not really kindergartners yet. They're preschoolers. They're aspiring to be kindergartners. And they'll get there. The teacher's going to get them there real quickly. But there's just always something fun and interesting like that that goes on. So keep praying for us as we minister to children and families every day. It's a lot of fun. Um, it makes the day fly by, makes the time fly by, and uh, you, you're blessed to have such a big, great ministry to all these families in the community um, right here on this campus, and so thanks for your prayers. All right, so Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday, youth group is starting back up. A couple of important things that help tie that together. Number one, uh, as was mentioned a couple of weeks ago, we are starting in Genesis uh, and working our way through Jesus this fall. And so Genesis 1 uh, is not this Wednesday. Actually, this Wednesday, Pastor Jim and I are teaming up and we're going to uh, give the youth just a broad overview of what to expect in the Old Testament. Because if you don't know, it's a wild ride. And so we're just going to lay some foundations and some principles and say this is uh, not just one book, but a series of books. And, and here's the ways to help you kind of understand and engage it. And then in two weeks... We start Genesis 1 and we just begin to say what are the key people and places and ideas where we see God's faithfulness speak to his people. And so if you are a youth, if you want to be a youth again, uh, if you want to help youth, we would love to see you on Wednesday night. One important factor for uh, anyone that wants to volunteer, we have some new games coming up and so it's it's really important that I get your waiver of liability signed. I, I'm not saying that, that you will get hurt, but should you get hurt, one of my life goals is to not go to prison. And so you signing that thing helps me out tremendously. And so this Wednesday, just like usual, we have dinner starting at 6 o'clock. So if you're actually part of the school and you want to show up at 3 o'clock, we have games and food and activities and everything free to six, uh, 3 to 6 is kind of that free time. We love to just hang out with the youth. And then starting at 6 is dinner. And then at 6.30, we start the youth group festivities. So be sure to join us starting this Wednesday for youth group. Okay. You can give the mic to Annette or Roger. Okay. Or Ashley. Okay. One last announcement coming up uh, this week. Uh, we start Journey, which is a men's group. We meet Thursday night, 6 to 7. The focus is, is on abiding in Christ. Uh, we look at John 15 and what that means. Uh, and if, if you sign up for, for Journey, it goes nine months. But, but men, if you want to just try it out, you're, you're invited to come for one month for free. won't cost you anything. Uh, the book will be free. You can try that out. After a month, decide if you want to continue. But that, that's this Thursday. Next weekend is M24, which is a free men's retreat up at Tehachapi. Starts Saturday at noon, goes Sunday to noon. Last year I went, there were 850 men that were up there. And it was a great time. It was a great experience. Uh, a lot of food. There's games. There's a lot of activities. Uh, wonderful time. Uh, guys bring tents, campers. Uh, sleeping bags, some sleep out on the ground, some sleep in their car. 
uh, whatever you want to do. It's, it's wide open. Okay? Ladies, you have a couple of announcements for us? Sure do, Pastor. So here, in your... Here, step over here so they can put you on, on the screen oh, and everybody okay. who turns into YouTube okay. can, yeah, all over the YouTube world can star. watch you. Oh, ooh. I'll pass on that one. Anyways, in your bulletins, there is a connection card. Um, no, that's me, Pat. You told me what to do. <laughs> Surprising, right? Anyways, there's a connection card. Go ahead and fill that out, and they'll be collected. Um, if you're a first-time guest, go ahead and fill that out and take it to the information booth after service for a little surprise. All right. Hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Um, and good morning. All right, so a church membership class is being held today with Pastor Jim in the church library. Uh, lunch is provided, so talk to Jim as soon as possible if you haven't signed up yet. Also, there's another flyer in your bulletin. Um, it's just, just describing the activities this fall. Um, Wednesday nights start at, on September 7th. Um, dinner will be at 5.30. Pat and I will be feeding you. Um, then there's HK Youth, Women's Ministry. They have a study um, on spiritual warfare. And then Alpha starts also. Okay, before I dismiss the kids, tomorrow is Mike Gonzalez's birthday. So happy birthday, Mikey. <laughs> All right. So... Now I'd like to dismiss the kids up to uh, through sixth grade to HK. Everybody go with Miss Jen there. Okay, now, if you all would like to stand up and greet one another.
places and have a seat. We'll uh, continue with the service this morning. Thank you for coming today. Um, we're going to pray for the offering. So if the ushers will come forward with the offering bags, uh, we want to remember in prayer, especially uh, Walter Coop has COVID and he's, he's getting some uh, health care treatment for that. And we want to pray for him. Uh, Dee Cox in the village, she's uh, got health issues as well as a couple other ladies over there. And we're having a couple of memorial services this week for people from the village. So, uh, you know, uh, we, we move through life and we're, I'm grateful to live there and be there and be part of the ministry there. I've had some great, had a great visit with Mavis this week and, and uh, shared with her and prayed with her. And she's just so rejoicing in, in a certainty, a certain hope, not a hopefulness, but a certain hope that she will be with the Lord in heaven when the, her day comes, and we're, we just rejoice in that. We weren't, there were no tears, there were no sadness, it was just rejoicing in the fact that it's so good to have a certain hope of that, and you can have a certain hope of that too. I'm going to pray for those things. We pray for uh, the school, great, great for the school, and I uh, got to be there uh, helping as they drop kids off, and Dan was running around, and people were doing stuff, and I'm standing there, and a parent walks up to me and says, what time is school out today? And I went, uh, I don't, and of course, they think that you should know these answers, simple, and, uh, 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 and I'm trying to find, I said, Dan, no, Dan, just called somebody, so I didn't know, so when you work at the church and you're just helping the school, you have no clue, and they think that you should know, because I look like I should know something, don't I, but I fooled them, and we want to pray for that, we'll pray for the offering too, Lord, we uphold these things to you, we pray for those who have health concerns, uh, Grave health concerns, uh, several that I can think of I won't mention, but we pray for Walter as he's recovering from uh, COVID, uh, for Dee and a couple other ladies at the village that are facing uh, significant health challenges. We thank you for the pray for the memorial services as we have, have a couple of those this week, and you comfort the families at this the, during those times, and for the school and the blessing that it is. For M24, with, you imagine 800 to 1,000 men coming and some hearing the gospel the first time. What an impact that'll have in lives uh, and churches and, and families. And that'll be a powerful time. We want to pray for that as well at this time. Thank you for the offering. Thank you for those that uh, have given. And I, on behalf of those from the Koinonia Fund, I thank you that your gifts go forward to touch lives and ministries in Africa and around the world and, and our community. And, and uh, they're multiplied and blessed. And we ask that you uh, just take these things, Lord, and use them to honor and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. on this verse. 
May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. Where heights of love, where depths of peace, where fears are still. Comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took all flesh, fullness of God in heaven. This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones He came to save Till on the cross that Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on Him was laid Here in the death of body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth then glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sins The sun comes 
wakes up, it's a new day dawning. It's hard to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing. Worship His holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. You're rich and love. Slow to anger, your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness, I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to Worship His holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. And on that day, when my strength is filled. The end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forevermore. Bless the Worship His holy name, sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His. good God is, how good he's been to you. No matter what we're going through, God is good and he blesses us. And if we sing to him, it totally changes our focus. Our problems seem really small because he is mighty. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name, Lord, I worship your holy name, Lord, I worship your holy name. Amen, amen. 
Would you read this um, reading, reading with us? It's going to be up on the screen. Men, would you start? Yes. Oh, Lord, thank you for all that you do and all that you've done. I do not thank you nearly enough. Lord, you heal and you forgive and you cleanse. Even the littlest joys in my life all come from you. Given you this day. Jesus, let your name be on my lips. And help me to boast of you to all people. You are my king, and I love you. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Amen. A few weeks ago, I mentioned that in the ancient world, humility was not viewed as a virtue. In fact, it was, it was really viewed as a, as a demeaning attitude of a slave. Uh, it was seen as a as a negative characteristic. So humility was a trait to be avoided in your life until, until Christ came. And that changed everyone's viewpoint because out of love, Christ humbly sacrificed his life. Dying a, a shameful death that was reserved for, for the worst of criminals so that we could be forgiven, so that we could live and have a relationship with God. But his life and example changed everyone's view of humility. Society's view of humility was turned upside down. Jesus' death and resurrection then became the model for living the Christian life. Jesus died and rose again. And as Christians, we die to ourselves. Why? So that God can live through us. That model of life and death has changed all of our relationships. Last week we saw in Ephesians 5, and our, as we continue our study in Ephesians, how Christ makes a Christian marriage radical. For example, a couple of verses in Ephesians 5, just as a review. First of all, verse 21, Paul said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, 2,000 years ago, that was radical for husbands and wives to submit to one another. But then also look at Verse 25, really a almost impossible command for husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So Jesus' example impacts our marriages, our family, our work. That's why today's message is entitled Radical Relationships for the Redeemed. There's a sermon outlined in your bulletin if you want to follow along. It's also on the church app. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Ephesians 5. I want to show you something. Um, there is an unfortunate chapter division uh, in Ephesians. Now, remember when, when Paul wrote this letter 2,000 years ago, uh, it, he just wrote it on one long scroll. There weren't chapter divisions. There weren't designations for individual verses. And so uh, when he thought of uh, guidelines for household relationships from Ephesians 5.21 all the way, the way through chapter 6, verse 9. He deals with household relationships. So it's, it's one long section. And it's interesting, if you look at the, the letter to Colossians, uh, Paul deals with the same three issues, the same relationships. Uh, and in both letters which were written basically at the same time, 
Paul gives instructions not only for, for husbands and wives, which we saw last week, but in today's passage, in chapter 6, we'll see instructions for, for parents and children, as well as masters and slaves. Now, it's important to remember, because sometimes this can be a little confusing, but it's important to remember that, that in the first century, 2,000 years ago, children, wives, and slaves, in many ways, were treated as property for the benefit of, of others. Look with me at some of Paul's commands in Ephesians 6, especially for uh, families and slaves and masters. You can follow along on the screen. Starting in verse 1, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Jesus ends up the, the source of liberation for wives, for children, for slaves, valuing all of them as, as real people. That's radical. Uh, it was radical to think that way 2,000 years ago. Now, to understand Paul's teaching on uh, you know, this entire passage, you need to understand the principles behind submission and authority. The husband, the parent, the master, they've all been given an authority from God to which others should submit. The Greek word for submit is pronounced hupotasso, uh, and at the heart of that word is the word taxis, which literally means order. And so submission is a humble recognition of the divine ordering of society, whether that relates to marriage, family, or work. God has a divine order he has in mind. Now, authority is never to be used selfishly. Authority, if someone is given authority, it's, been, it's given to them for the benefit of others so that their lives would grow and their lives would flourish. And so given that, this understanding, uh, let's take a moment and review what, what family life was really like in the first century in the Roman Empire. And, and you'll see Paul's words sort of countercultural to, to some of that. Now, remember when Paul wrote this letter, he's writing from Rome. So he's right in the middle of the Roman Empire. 2,000 years ago, a Roman father had absolute power over his family. He could sell them as slaves. He could force his children to work out in the fields with chains wrapped around their bodies. He could punish them any way he liked. He had the authority and the right to even kill them if he wanted to. A Roman father had that much power and authority. In fact, when a child was born, it would be placed at the father's feet. And if he, sto if he stooped over and picked it up, then he accepted that child and he kept it. But if a child was placed at his feet and he turned and walked away, ignoring that child, often that child was literally thrown away. And unwanted children would, would be often left in the town square where other people would often take advantage of them and come and pick them up, take them, and turn them into slaves or prostitutes. And it was Christians, it was the early church that often went to the town square and picked up unwanted children and cared for them, forming orphanages and, and protecting them. And so Paul writes and gives commands to children. And in verse 1 he says, for children to obey their parents, to honor their, 
father and mother. He's quoting from the Ten Commandments. And then he refers to this as the first commandment. Well, we know it's not the first of the Ten Commandments. Though if, if you're familiar with them, you may remember that the first four commandments deal with our relationship with God. That's sort of the, the vertical dimension of those commands. The other six commands of the Ten Commandments deal with our relationships with others. Those deal with the horizontal aspect of, of our life. But honor your father and mother is the first command that deals with people. It's the first horizontal commandment. And Paul had instructions for, for fathers and or parents when it says in verse 4, you know, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Fathers can also refer to parents there. But he says in, in verse 4, do not exasperate your children. Some, some versions translate that as do not provoke your children to anger. And parents today know that if you have multiple children, every child is different. Each has their, their, their own personality, their own temperament. Uh, and you need to, to be aware of that to, to raise each child perhaps in, in different aspects. Uh, but every child must be allowed to be themselves. Uh, which affirms diversity in their personalities. Uh, wise parents recognize the difference between nonconformity and, and rebellion. Uh, and Paul then makes the comment, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Training there really refers to uh, training by discipline. Uh, it's an emphasis on, on correction of the young. And then he says information, which can be uh, or instruction, which can refer to information or a warning, and that refers to, to verbal instruction or teaching. So Paul is saying, you know, do not provoke your children to anger, but rather raise them with, with correction and with teaching. Paul then goes on in Ephesians 6 to give commands for, for uh, masters and slaves, which for some people today in the 21st century, can be a little confusing. Um, of, often I find that, that, especially here in America, you read commands about masters and slaves, and we automatically equate that. We think of, of slavery in America in the 1700s. Uh, we equate that with, with the racial, uh, the injustice of, of the racial uh, slavery, slavery that, that occurred in our country. And that's really an incorrect approach. Um, let me try to explain. Slavery was, was viewed completely different in the first century. Um, while the slavery in America was basically racial, slavery 2,000 years ago was, was mainly an economic institution. Uh, slaves were the primary workforce in the Roman Empire. Uh, slaves could be inherited or purchased. Uh, you, could, uh, you could get them as a settlement of a bad debt. They could be prisoners of war. But slaves were a high capital investment. You took care of slaves if you owned them. Uh, but slave, slavery was an indispensable part of the Roman Empire. Uh, in, in most cities, there were more slaves than free people. Uh, and if you would have freed all the slaves, many of them would have ended up in poverty. Um, and as I mentioned, in, in the first century, uh, slavery was primarily a, a, an economic institution. If you couldn't pay your debts, you know what? You and your family would become slaves of someone else to pay off your debt. In Israel, this is really hard to imagine, but in Israel, some slaves liked working for their masters so much that they would, some went to their master and said, I'm willing to become a slave to you for the rest of my life because there's room and board and there's care, there's people that care for them, they provide for their needs, they're willing to work for them, all of their needs are met. And so uh, the the Old Testament gave instructions uh, for what masters and slaves were to do if, if a person wanted to be a slave for life. And there's instructions for that. Here's the point. Paul, ex Paul accepted slavery in his day. And he encourages slaves to be good workers. But he, all, I mean, he encourages you know, those who, who are free to be good workers as well. Uh, the same standards apply. Whether you're slave or free, verse 8 says... Work as though you're working for the Lord. And then this would have been radical. In verse 9, Paul challenges the masters to treat slaves with kindness. 
saying that, you know, God is the master of both slaves and free people, and God shows no favoritism. He doesn't look down on slaves and high on masters. He looks upon each as, as the same. Each has been made in God's image. Some of you may remember in, in the short New Testament letter of Philemon, one chapter long, it's a great letter. Paul writes to his friend Philemon and encourages him to, to take back a slave who has run away. The slave's name was Onesimus, and Paul's sending him back. But Onesimus came to Paul. Paul led him to the Lord, led the slave, the runaway slave to the Lord, and said, you need to go back to Philemon, your master. And so Paul writes a letter encouraging Philemon to take the slave back. Philemon, by law, could have killed the slave because he ran away. But Paul says, don't kill him. I want you to welcome him back as a brother in Christ. It's a powerful letter. Then I ask this question on your outline. Why didn't Christians try to abolish slavery in the first century? Well, you've got to look at the big picture here. 2,000 years ago, Christians were a small, insignificant group in the Roman Empire. When you look at the grand scheme of things, in, in many ways, uh, the Christian faith was, it was an unlawful religion. And Christians in that time really had no political power. So they didn't have any influence or clout to, to change that institution. And so they, they simply encouraged those who were involved in slavery uh, to be good workers, masters, treat your slaves with kindness. So what do these commands mean for us today? 2,000 years ago, Ephesians 5, 21 to 6, 9 were instructions for marriage and family relationships as well as work. And it was radical for, for that day. For some people today, these commands may still seem radical. And whether we know it or not, all of us are trained for marriage and parenting by the family that we grow up in. The family of origin, social scientists refer to it. Justin gave me a book to read as part of our church vision team called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And in chapter one, the author makes this comment about our origin of family. He says, very, very few people emerge out of their families of origin emotionally whole or mature. The author is talking to, about you and me. See, most of us live in a way that, whether we realize it or not, it reflects the home that we grew up in. Even if we knew that, that some of the things our parents did were, were wrong, that's the only model we saw. We often repeat it without realizing it. The sad reality, if we're honest, is that every family is broken. Every family has been damaged by sin. And so in some ways, we end up broken too. Let me give you some examples. Have you ever heard this phrase? Love is blind, but marriage is a real eye-opener. I talked with a, a couple last spring who were engaged. And I shared with them this piece of advice. I said, listen, you know, when you get married, you learn a lot about yourself. And I just want to tell you, not everything you learn, you're going to like. And I remember telling that to fellow students shortly after I had gotten married when I was in seminary. So there, there's two things you learn to do only by doing them. One is being married. Second is being a parent. You can read all the books you want and go to the seminars, but until you're there living life, married, learning to be a parent, figuring out a child who's rebelling and figuring all that, you don't know what it's like until you're on the, the battle lines there. I've shared this example with you before, but for me personally growing up, I had a father who was emotionally distant and he never really communicated emotions with us. But, you know, since he was a good provider and he had a strong work ethic, his example to me was very positive, I thought he was a normal dad. Then I got married. 
And I realized I didn't really know how to communicate emotions. You know what I learned? Emotions is the language of women. And if you don't know how to communicate, you don't know how to resolve conflict. And so what do I do? I just do what my dad did. When my dad got in conflict with my mom, he had a simple solution. He got up and walked into another room. That was the example I had seen. So I tried that early in our marriage with Annette. We lived in a two-room apartment. <laughs> got up and walked into the other room. That was probably the first and last time I attempted that. Because uh, she followed me in. I couldn't get away. I walked in and to my, I didn't say this to, my, to myself. I'm saying, what are you doing? I'm trying to get away. And that was rather difficult. At one point, I found myself resenting the fact that I had, I had not really learned healthy relational skills while I was growing up. But later as an adult, I learned about the family that my dad grew up in, and it was very enlightening. Because his mother, my grandmother, she never really shared uh, emotions or even affection. I remember my grandmother uh, lived with us uh, for a few months when I was six or seven uh, years old. Uh, and my mom told me a story which was very revealing. She told me a story of one day my brother, who was about 18 months younger than, than I am, uh, my brother and I came home from school, and my mom greeted us by, by hugging us and kissing us and asking how our day was and wanting, asking if we wanted a snack. And, and my grandmother pulled her aside and scolded her scolded my mom, saying, you're going to spoil those, those boys by being so kind to them. And she said something like, listen, I raised two boys, you got to teach boys to be tough. Okay? That's the woman that raised my dad. Okay? Now, I don't really remember my grandfather, my dad's dad, for the simple reason he committed suicide when I was two years old. I've been told he battled depression, which is very common for people who are suicidal. I mean, every suicidal person is battling depression. And all of a sudden, that gave me a whole new picture. My dad and the, and the home he was raised in. My dad was, was raised by a mother who didn't express emotions or affection. My dad was raised by a father who battled depression and, and was angry. So it was natural. My dad parented the same way he was parented. That was like the light went on, and I, completely had, I had a completely different perspective of my dad. The anger that I had held toward my dad turned into sorrow and sympathy. And what it meant for me was I had to relearn, through the help of Annette and others, what it meant to be a healthy husband and, and father. Um, did you know that God revealed this behavior pattern to the Israelites thousands of years ago? Thank you. <laughs> now that we have your attention. When God gave the Ten Commandments, listen to, to one thing he said before he, uh, as he, as he shared those Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, verses 5 and 6, God said this, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, Look at the next phrase. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who, keep me, who love me and keep my commandments. There are unhealthy examples from our past that shape our lifestyle today, that impact our marriage, our family life, in our work, they have to be recognized and broken for us to be freed, for us to live life to the full. One key to freedom and fullness is to experience the unconditional and unlimited love of God, which he wants to show to a thousand generations. It's God's love that needs to replace those unhealthy patterns we were given. And when we allow God's love to heal 
us of destructive habits and emotions so that we are free, so that we are healed, then our lifestyles in our home and work, you know what? They often seem radical to, to other people. I know comments like this may trigger questions. Uh, you may want to uh, know more about this. Maybe you just want to, to pray with someone. Um, we're available to, to share with you, to pray with you, um, if that would be helpful for you. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer, shall we? God, as we think of our lives, for those of us who are married, for those of us who are parents, uh, many of us who are, are involved in, in work relationships with others, God, we're reminded here in Ephesians 5 and 6 that, that Christ needs to be the model uh, for our roles, our responsibilities, how we relate to, to other people in our life. May Jesus' example of love, sacrifice, and service be the example, the model, the pattern that we follow in all of our relationships and in our life. May we reflect that example for your honor, for your glory. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let me invite you to, to as you stand for our final song, go ahead and, and pass your connection cards to the center aisle, and ushers will pick those up. We're going to sing together before we close the service with our final benediction. last thing before we recite the end of Ephesians 3. Um, I'm leading a membership class today, 1215. If, if you want to be part of that but haven't signed up, uh, tell me right away because we provide lunch. If you want to come and you forget to tell me, you're just eating a bag of Fritos. Um, so we'd love to have you join us if, if that's what you want to do. I already have a handful of people who are coming, but uh, talk to me if you're interested. Let's recite together Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 as our benediction. Benediction literally means a good word. And so here's a good word that God has to share for each of us. And it's a great promise. Let's say this together. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you. God bless you.